Well, here we are for another great episode of Decoding the Conflict Mindset. And I'm sure our topic today is going to spark the interest in minds of thousands and thousands of women throughout uh, our the world uh, and throughout our communities. And so as your host and founder of Decoding the Conflict Mindset, I am so delighted to bring to you today, Beverly Glazer. Welcome, Beverly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deborah. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, I know we've done some reciprocity uh, so far and that you've got your own podcast. And so just say a brief uh, you know, introduction to your podcast so people are aware of that and can start looking for that. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. My podcast is called Aging with Purpose and Passion, which is my passion, mm -hmm. because my focus is really on helping older women, empowering older women to live their best lives powerfully with integrity and forever, meaning that throughout all our challenges, we thrive. And that's exactly what this podcast is about. It's about women, women's stories, women's heroine journeys, although I call it a hero journey, as Joseph Campbell would have it. Right. Rising above. And the more of these episodes I do, the more I am inspired to do more because we women over 50 are so amazing. And we're just beginning because this generation is really the first to live our, our full life to the maximum. A hundred years and plus, Dr. Deborah, isn't that amazing? That is amazing, Beverly. And I'm 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 just thrilled that you know you've really focused on that um that segment of the population for a number of reasons, but just a couple that come to my mind is that, you know, um, you know, for many, for many, regardless of your gender, you know, we're working longer later into life. We're still achieving, um, shifting careers as we end one career and, you know, start off in something else. And, um, and then two is that, you know, when we talk about women who are approaching 50 or over 50, and then even uh, on, you know, we have a long way to go, but, you know, hopefully seeing more and more females in top leadership positions. And um, because we know the studies show that, you know, organizations are far more profitable and much happier when there are women in charge or at least part of the decision-making process. So, uh, you know, I think it's just really timely and there's just a lot of things going on. I think about females in the workforce, females as the age uh, that are, are critically important. We're learning a lot with the neuroscience of what we're studying. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And when you said women as we age, I, I think that is something too, because in the workplace, particularly corporate, women can be looked at, not supposed to be, but they still are very uh, as objects in the office. Mm -hmm. And the older woman seems to be, well, she doesn't have much of a place. And this is where my podcast and this is where my therapy and the work that I do, the coaching primarily, because I pivoted into coaching because everyone needs help, mm -hmm. mindset training, but not everyone needs therapy. And mm -hmm. for the older woman, that's where the conflict comes. Very often in their career, they're not satisfied. And why? Because maybe they don't get that promotion. Or they're expected to be doing more, have more, being more at that specific age. There is ageism in the office. There is a mm -hmm. feeling that I'm not good enough when a young upstart comes up with all the technology and all the newfound ideas. And a man has difficulty too. I'm not making all these gender differences, but my focus is really primarily with women because Women are relatively new to the workplace when you think about it. Mm -hmm. And women also have so many different roles. And from being a mother, from being an executive, from having a career, from taking care of elderly parents, there are so many different roles that women play. And often we lose sight of who we are or what role we should play. So when I do my really premier corporate coaching and it's really intense with the client to get them where they want to be and to connect the missing links, 
that's where you get rid of the guilt. That's where you get rid of the shame. That's where you can be who you really are. Be true to yourself. And that's in the boardroom. That's in the office. That's in the kitchen. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter where. You have to be yourself. And then there is no conflict. The major conflict is who you're supposed to be and the acting the role playing that you feel that you should have, because often we are the pioneer that have stepped up into that mm -hmm. role and there isn't the female modeling out there. We are it. Yes. And goes on also, as you know, Dr. Deborah, there's an expectation of how a woman should act, mm -hmm. who she should be, how we should take roles and rules from her. And, and there is this cognitive disconnect as who you are and who you should be. And that's uh, a, it's a conflict I see all the time with my clients who have gone through careers, mm -hmm. gone as high as they can go and more, and then they come to, and now what? Yeah. What's next? What's next for me? And if I step down, it's step down to what? And that's whether it's retirement, whether it's that being a CEO, a CFO in a company mm -hmm. or whatever, it's like, and now what? And so, uh, so yes, my focus is women over 50, women who have arrived and women who still want more. Mm -hmm. Our society says, well, you know, girl, you did a lot. Yeah. There's still more to do. Yes. Inside. Yeah, you know, I really appreciate, um, you know, uh, how you shift, you know, your focus on mindset, because clearly that's what drives my work as well. And we both have that mental health background. And um, I, I'm going to take this opportunity, Beverly, to just acknowledge for people that, you know, again, therapy, unfortunately, has long implied what's wrong with you. And we got to fix it. That's the medical model. Okay. And yet um, in, in today's world, there's oftentimes not anything wrong with us per se, but we're challenged. We're challenged in you know, life as it's unfolded and life as it's transpired. And, and again, uh, I, I shifted my perspective of quite a while ago too, in terms of, I want to help you grow into the person you want to become, you know, what's your vision of that and where do you want to show up and how do you show up and the skills you bring to that? Because um, it's not about diagnosing what's wrong. I don't care about that, but I do look at the factors that help contribute to who you are today. And then where do we go from there? And not to say there may be some underlying things, but again, you know, let's sort through this because we, we are complex uh, on many, many levels and we know the mind body connections there. And so we've got to look at that interplay between what we think, how we feel and how our bodies are responding. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, Beverly, um, you know, you, you mentioned you made the pivot, you know, from the therapy into a premier coaching. And is there a, a particular story or maybe an event or two or whatever, maybe more uh, that really, you know, oh. cultivated that shift for you? Because I think that's important for people to understand, because that's part of the mindset, too. We can embrace a new mindset for how we go forward. Yes. Well, as you mentioned, um, my background is in therapy. But the way it found me was I was working in art as an art consultant with Indigenous people from way up in the North. And wet, and when I'm talking North, I'm in Canada. So I'm talking high North. And there's addiction and all kinds of other socioeconomic problems up there. And I was working with them, selling art, bringing it down South to areas like Toronto, Montreal, corporate. And I loved what I did, but I felt I wanted to do more for people. I really mm -hmm. did. And that's where I literally said, okay, this is it. I want to go back to school. And I had this company and with the support of my husband and, you know, he said, go ahead, do what you want. And I went back to school and I studied, and I don't have to tell you, Deborah, what it takes to go <laughs> one degree after another and to do it and to raise a family and to do all that. And then guess what? How? 
Um, there was a fraud in my husband's company. I was attacked as the wife because they looked at where is the fraud? What happened? My husband went to the bank and he said, look, work with us. We don't know what happened. They said, sure, no problem. And what they did was they called it for millions of dollars. And naturally they wanted me because I was in charge of the house. The house was in my name. So in that process, I, I didn't know what to do. Okay. I knew nothing. I was in graduate school for goodness sake. Right. And so when all these papers and everything came down on my head, I could have lost not only the house, I could have lost my marriage and everything else as well as my family. However, I put it all together and I stayed focused and I got my degrees and with the support of my husband and it, the, it took eight years Mm -hmm. I stood up to the Toronto Dominion Bank and I mm -hmm. stood up to everybody and I not only got my degrees and opened my private practice, I had a radio show. I don't tell me how much I did to overcome those challenges. But after 35 years or so in private practice and listening to all these women that I, as well as men, and mm -hmm. helping and working with them. I realized that it doesn't take a lawsuit, that it doesn't really matter, that everybody has their challenges and we are so powerful within. Mm -hmm. And I have been helping women my whole life pretty well now to reinvent themselves and change their lives. And this is how I pivoted, particularly after COVID, where not everyone does need therapy, but everyone needs help. Mm -hmm. And that's where I built that process, which is really simple in six steps, really, to mm -hmm. find who you are, to find what your strength is, to break those crazy limiting beliefs that we all have, the judgment calls that go into corporate and everywhere else. And that's in your business and your personal life, because let's face it, they interconnect <laughs> your life and your business, whether you like it or not, you take it with you. Right. So that's how I do what I do. And I encourage others to really find their passion too, because I know my mother, who was who had her degrees in the time when women did not, who was a social worker, but only worked temporarily until she got married because it really wasn't encouraged back in the day because my dad was a professional. And so the woman was supposed to do volunteer work, which she loved, but mm -hmm. she was not thriving. Right. And so I believe and I know that so many women just take a step aside and mm -hmm. are secondary to their husbands, to their families. It shouldn't be secondary. You don't have to be first, but you can be your own person and, and thrive. And over 60% of women have given up on their dreams. Yes. Oh. Yes, I've heard similar statistics like that. And so um, your six steps, I, I believe you refer to as the reinvention formula, I right? I call it the reinvention formula, yes. Yeah, great, great. And um, yeah, and so it's very important to, to find those missing links and to make those connections and to really uncover, um, you know, what... Uh, what are your goals? What are your aspirations? And like you, um, I know for me, and I think for many others, is that we we are stimulated, we're um, encouraged, or maybe we're even just motivated um, sometimes by the adversities that we encounter. And so I have a saying out of moments of pain comes the momentum for gain. And so don't look at those adversities as poor me, but instead say, okay, not working. Guess I better do something else. This is an opportunity. Yes, that's really good. Unfortunately, though, when everything hits you, you're not thinking it like that. You know, oh, I know. do not. However, after the dust settles, mm -hmm. you ha you can have two courses of action, really. Where am I going? 
what has it led me and moving forward? Or I'm going to crawl under a rock and mm -hmm. I can't get out. Oh, poor me, the victim. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think everyone has to see. We can all be victims and we can have our pity party for a while, mm -hmm. but it's enough because where is that going to get you? Right, and right. So I like to always say is that, you know, it's like, how's that working for you? you that, that is a choice, but is that how you want to live? So can you share an example, you know, some transformer story from somebody you've worked with, in, you know, in a, in a few, you know, sentences as far as, you know, how you help create this change so people can get a, a feel for that? Sure. I use a lot of stories. I use a lot of analogies. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example of... Um, this wonderful client that I've had who is in corporate and she's in finance and she really knows her stuff. And as everybody knows, it's really a man's world out there. And when you're working oh. in and money, oh yes, it's still that. Yes. And she had quite a few clients who would come and now you're dealing with a lot of their money. And they would come and they also know business and they can also know finance and they're always coming and they're challenging her. Mm -hmm. There was a conflict all the time. Now, when you're coming in and you're talking to someone who doesn't really understand what goes on in the finance world, it's a lot easier because she's mm -hmm. the advisor. But for someone else, not so much. So mm -hmm. she always threatened by a couple of these particular clients and it would really bother her. And one of the things I said to her was, you know, you're not only giving them too much power, but you happen to be living in mm -hmm. their movie. And everyone is the hero of their movie, are they not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I said, oh, this is your movie. When mm -hmm. she's coming in, be the director of your movie. So mm -hmm. you up there and you be the star and you tell her what you have to do what she's doing is she's running the show and the next time I spoke to her she says to me Beverly you will not believe it next time she came into my office I knew that I would be walking on my set and she says and I walked into the set and mm -hmm. guess what I had her as a complete extra in my movie. <laughs> oh, I like it. A little and, role reassignment. <laughs> and, oh. she's, and that has completely broken my feeling of inferiority. And that's it. You know, these are just one of the many, many techniques that I use. I love to make it fun. I love to have people see and twist and change their thinking because we are so structured and we're brought up that this is the way it's supposed to be. And I'm not mm -hmm. good enough. And, you know, and we have to look like this and that and the other, you know what? No, no, you really don't just mm -hmm. be. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, what you just described Beverly it reminds me of a line of a movie I enjoy um, called the holiday and, uh, and, uh, and it was a Hollywood screenwriter who's been around for years and he's very admired. And and uh, uh, a, a woman comes over from England in a swap and and basically um, he goes, well, you know, the thing is you've always been playing the supporting the supporting role. You know, you deserve to be the leading lady in your own life. And it's like, oh, I, I like how that sounds. And that's sort of what you're just talking about too, is that we deserve to be the leading lady in our own lives. So live your story. That's it. And she made her an extra. So that she was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, when, when you uh, talk about your reinvention formula, I think people always, you know, they, they get excited about it, but then they want, well, how does that work? And so what are, you know, two or three specific strategies that someone might, you know, go through in their journey with you? Well, what, there are different levels. Okay. And when I am, I call it the formula because when we're working together, when I do groups, mm -hmm. then I do work through it in six, you know, in those six areas mm -hmm. where each area has many different exercises and you start with really who you are. 
not what you do, but who mm -hmm. are you really, really? And we go through that and how we've become to evolve who we are really, really <laughs> to the top of the pyramid, which is the sixth step. And that is really when we really recreate yourself and you be who you are. And that could be in your workplace or maybe pivot mm -hmm. into something else or have mm -hmm. other activities that you want to do or put together your retirement if you want to use that. And maybe it's not a retirement, but whatever. But it's not only finding yourself, it's finding your purpose, not necessarily, and that may not necessarily be what your job is. Mm -hmm. Because when we go into whatever we do, it's not necessarily, I'm using that word a lot, I'm hearing, fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people, I've had clients who are doctors and say, you know, I hate it. Yeah. I like medicine, but I really do not like my job. Yeah. And this is what happens a lot. We spend so much time in school. We so so much time following that road and the road has led us to be who we are but we still are not fulfilled mm -hmm. and so it's finding fulfillment and finding it through who we are and you don't have to be stuck to go through this process if you want if anyone wants to just mm -hmm. be more fulfilled in their lives you can keep your job you can keep everything you have but what it is it's it's an add-on and that's mm -hmm. what that whole reinvention process is. And mm -hmm. to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, of course, I don't do it in stages. What we do is we work through where you are, where you're going to go, and we've set up you know, goals. But basically, the structure is there. Okay. And it's just simplified. In okay. Those I have a question, you know, actually two. And, um, you know, in our remaining time that we have, uh, you know, one, you emphasize your work with women over 50. We know that people are staying in the workplace a lot longer um, and uh, still aspiring and achieving roles and responsibilities. Uh, so my first question is, um, you know, what do you see as being some of the unique, you know, maybe two or three unique challenges that female leaders face today? And particularly when it comes to dealing with conflict, you know, are there some natural things that they do well when it deals with, comes to conflict or are there things that actually get in their way? The other question I want you to think about, and I'll try to steer you back to it. We're seeing more and more um, uh, reports about how the high, high, highest prevalency of drinking is no longer among uh, you know, older professional men, but as, you know, reached into the circles of professional women, you know, uh, tend to be more uh, higher socioeconomic circles, but also, um, you know, perhaps uh, leadership roles as well. And so, um, uh, you know, maybe commenting on alcohol being used as a, a coping mechanism as those pressures, a, lot, a lot's changed. So let's go back to the first one. What are two or three unique challenges that you feel female leaders face today? Well, the first... And the most obvious is you're a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's pretty well in your face. Yeah. And that's a challenge in yourself. And mm -hmm. I know that I've found it myself just working even in crisis intervention with people. It's like, who are you? Mm -hmm. and should we listen to you? Mm -hmm. So I do believe that men, now this may be my own personal bias, but men do not have to prove themselves as much. Mm -hmm. I believe that a woman is judged. Is she pretty? How should she look? What is she dressed like? Et cetera, et cetera. Is she rude? Can I take instructions from her? Does she, where does she come from? What does she really know? And so I think that it takes more of a learning curve to start to fit in to that role if you're a woman, I, I really do. Um, I think on the other hand, women are generally better listeners mm -hmm. and they will be better at including people into a team. But um, that I, I think is, is, is very good. However, mm -hmm. 
challenge also is a lot of women feel, well, maybe I'm not tough enough. Mm -hmm. And then she can be known as, well, she's the bitch. And mm -hmm. I don't believe that you have to change your personality one iota to really get what you need and get the productivity from the people and from your team. I really do not believe that at all. Right. right. And I think, you know, because um, I do a lot of, uh, you know, communications training, conflict management training uh, in organizations. Um, and I think, uh, and, and what you just said totally, um, you know, correlates with some recent studies that I've um, been looking at and just uh, had a newsletter about. And, and since I'm in the mediation world, take, taking a look at the unique qualities that females bring to the world of conflict uh, that may be different than men. And I think that, uh, you know, I agree totally that those are, are real attributes of, of females. Uh, I think the challenge we have sometimes in carrying that out, like in a group setting, is that when we still have those males that have that old mindset, regardless of what age they are, that will push back and what are you doing, you know? And and so it's 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 truly a, um, a unique yet set of skills and mindset to uh, to thrive and to use our natural abilities effectively. Absolutely. And after many years of those challenges of coming to work every single day and the higher up you are, the higher you are um, in the organization, the more stress I'm going, pivoting into your next question, the more stress it is on that woman in that role. Mm -hmm. And there is a tendency, particularly in the roles that I've seen women in, which would be CEOs and CFOs on the very top, the, the pressure of going out to drink, the social life, the alcohol, that does kick in. And at one time, women didn't partake in taking shots. Today, they do. Mm -hmm. And they do go out into the bars and it can be a lonely life traveling and living out of suitcases. And women struggle differently than men in that respect as well. Mm. A man who is drunk, and I'll use the word drunk, or even an alcoholic, or I'd rather say has a substance dependency, it's mm -hmm. excused. It's not looked upon too badly, but he's got a problem. But a woman... That is really looked at as bad. And women have this guilt. They have this shame. Um, it's not only with alcohol. It's with other compulsive behaviors like food, mm -hmm. um, gambling. But gambling is a secret kind of behavior. Yeah. Many women end up you know, going to this casino, going to this like just to relieve the pressure. Right. And... It's, it's always a secret. Women are the drinkers that will go out, they will go out and party, but they'll also drink at home alone. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a comfort and it's due to the stress. Um, it's usually always due to the stress from one way or another. But for a woman, it's particularly hard because who does she tell? Mm -hmm. There's that embarrassment that comes in. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be that woman. You're supposed to be all things to everybody. You're supposed to be amazing in the office and a terrific wife and mother and on the school board, et cetera, et cetera. Pressure, 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 mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to have balance. You have to be able to have integrity in yourself. You have to be able to set boundaries and you have to know when enough is enough. And that's mm -hmm. in the workplace. And that's in the home. Yes. Yes. That work-life balance is, uh, again, something else that we, we struggle with. Um, and I think probably more so than our, our male counterparts. And so, Beverly, um, you know, I imagine that what we've been talking about is certainly, you know, uh, you're setting off some alarm bells for people as far as, oh, you know, that, that could be me. Or, you know, I am, I'm really sort of stuck and uh, or I'm challenged in where I'm going or I'm not happy. I'm not feeling fulfilled. Um, how do they reach you then if they want to partake in your services to, to make a better pathway moving forward? Absolutely. 
I'm very easily reached at on LinkedIn everywhere. And of course, on my site, which is reinventimpossible.com. And, um, and yes, I'm on all social media, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, I don't use so much, but um, you can find me just Google my name, I'm there and aging with purpose and passion. You'll also have my links. And I believe also, you have the 25 questions there, there's a link that people may want to see where they are, how they, what's missing in your life, where you want to go, you know, what is the gap between mm -hmm. who you are and where you want to be. But I always love to speak to people and just schedule a conversation. There's a link there too. And it's on, as I said, my website, theinventedpossible.com. Just call me, we'll talk, quick Zoom, quick call, and we can put it together. That's it. That's all. That's great, Beverly. You know, I'm I'm so appreciative of people like you who um you know have made that shift in mindset also as far as you know the the therapeutic what's wrong with you to um you know the coaching about what's you know what what gifts and talents do you have yet to bring on and unfold, you know, and to a live a happier, healthier life in so many levels. And so I want to say thank you for all the work that you've done and the opportunity to be here today and to speak to all, all the women, uh, well, not just over 50, but anybody, so that you, as you prepare for your life ahead, uh, know, know some of the challenges. We are in a unique um, time frame, shall we say, um, in terms of women's roles in the workplace and been there for a while, but you know, it continues to evolve. And so we'll continue to see some evolution. Sure, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Beverly. And uh, listeners, viewers, you know, you've got more coming, believe me. Uh, we'll have everything out, uh, you know, available to you uh, in, in our show notes for Beverly's interview. And so thank you for being here. Pass it on. Are you aware or are you familiar with somebody challenged uh, in where they, uh, where they are in life and how they show up? Well, this is a great opportunity to say, hey, you should listen to this podcast. There might be some really good things in there. So thank you again, Dr. Deborah Dupree, your host and founder, Decoding the Conflict Mindset.